been challenged lately to think about a question that uh, is kind of out there as far as my experience, something I would not normally gravitate toward in considering. And so because it's kind of beyond my scope, beyond my comfort, I guess, as well, I think maybe the Lord has been impressing this question upon me. And of course, whatever he impresses on me, uh, I bring it to you. So <laughs> whether this is where you want to go or not, when he impresses something on me, that's kind of the direction things go. But uh, it is a very simple question. But I've come to realize it is a vitally important question. It is simply this. How do you see the world? How do you view the world? What is your personal assessment of the world around you? And again, I've just, for whatever reason, that question has been coming back to me again and again. I think the Lord's directing me to take another look at the world that I live in, the world that we live in, and what is my assessment, what is your assessment, as you look out on the world, what's your view of it? Is the world hopelessly broken? Is it fixable but in desperate need? Is the, the problem of the world somebody else's concern? Well, I just simply get by and make the best of a broken world. Is it my mission? Is it your main mission to do all that we can to help fix that which is broken in the world? Those are all questions that go along with that. How do you see or how do you view the world? The issue in all of that is very simply called world view. And I guess we all have a world view. And basically the world view amounts to the glasses that we put on and we all put them on and we look out at the world. And wow, that sure is a big eye looking at us there, kind of like Big Brother's watching. What is your world view? And that is a key question in front of us today. And I think that what the Lord is doing in my life, at least, is challenging me to develop a very deliberate biblical world view. And I probably should have done that a long time ago, but I've just lately come to realize that the worldview that I have, I think a lot of it has come from the glasses, so to speak, that others have given me to put on, kind of just reacting to how I ought to view the world. So I guess I've come to realize that I have kind of a patchwork worldview, and I don't know that it's necessarily been mine, and it may not be truly biblical. And so the challenge is to take a look at the world around through deliberate biblical eyes. And so that is a challenge and one that I would, by extension, like to issue to you. An example of this challenge of a worldview, I know that years ago I was forced to take a closer look at the problem of abortion. And some families in the church that I had pastored at the time were heavily involved in the right to life movement. And the more I learned about the right to life movement, the main agenda was to repeal the Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision. That's really what, what their activities were all about. And as I was challenged by radical involvement by some families, and of course some pressure that I be involved as well, and I had to consider my worldview in terms of that issue. I've always been opposed to abortion on demand. But was the right to life movement the right response for me? Was it worthy of my concentrated energies? Was that the thing to do in response or get involved in a local crisis pregnancy center or do both things or do something else entirely different? What was my worldview in terms of that? Another issue, and many of us have dealt with this throughout our lifetime, and that is the era of the religious right movement. You all remember that? We don't hear too much about it today today, but back uh, several years ago, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on the religious right that if Christians would just simply band together and invest a lot of money and a lot of time in getting the right candidates elected to office, then at least this country would be in a better position. And uh, so that was a challenge for me and probably for many of us. Is that what we're supposed to do? Is that how we're supposed to live? Are we supposed to get very, very politically active and try to get the right candidates elected to office. I want you to notice one thing I'm doing here. I'm not giving any answers. I'm just giving you a lot of questions. That's how it's going to go because I think this is a big part of it, is asking the questions and biblically and prayerfully trying to come to terms with what is the right response 
And what kind of worldview do I develop as I look into Scripture and as I am prayerful about it? Again, I think that there is a great need to see with greater clarity from a biblical worldview because a worldview radically impacts uh, you and I and everything we're about, everything that we do. It impacts us as a church, and that may be part of why I've been drawn to this, because it directs what we do in terms of missions and in terms of service and evangelism specifically. And so it determines what we will do and also what we will not do. So I, I come to realize this idea of a deliberate biblical worldview is far more important than I used to think before. The need for a biblical worldview is punctuated by the fact, as you probably already know, that we live in two worlds. I'm taken back to the words of Jesus in John chapter 17 when he says to his disciples in verse 11, they are in the world, but in verse 16, they are not of the world. That is the ongoing dilemma. We are in a world system that we do not really belong to. Therein is the challenge. We sort of have a foot in two different worlds. We have to live in this one, but our real allegiance is not to this particular system. And so what do we do as we live in a world that we do not belong to? You know, I'm thinking about the beliefs that we hold to and how that makes a difference in a worldview. Many, if not most of us in this view, uh, in this room, have a different view in terms of God's plan for planet Earth. Uh, there's a common belief that many hold to, heaven after you die, that potentially can lead you to be less concerned about the world because of believing that God is going to consign this present world to the cosmic scrap heap. And so God's going to get rid of it because it's broken. And the great hope is to escape from it. And I've been thinking that to hold to a belief like that, I might not be all that concerned about this world because it's going to get jettisoned anyway. So I've been coming to think of the fact that I believe God has an ongoing plan for planet Earth. Believing literally that the meek are going to inherit the Earth, does that give me and give us a greater responsibility for ecology and politics and social action? Again, I raise more questions. I don't provide answers. Again, as we have a foot in two different worlds, Reminded in 1 John 5, 19, we quote it often, that the whole world or this present system lies in the power of the evil one. So it's easy to say this present world that we have a foot in is the devil's domain. And so do we just let him have his way until Christ returns? Or are there specific battles that we wage against him and the system as we live in it? Again, more questions, no answers. What I'd like us to do in the next few weeks as these things come front and center is to look specifically at some Bible passages from the point of reference of how do they guide us to have a biblical world view. I think this is going to go in a little different direction than I've ever gone and maybe you as well. But looking at some familiar passages and how do they direct us as those who live in this world but who are not of the world to, to clarify our, our world view what do we do and what do we not do as we live in this world? So, with that said, I'd like you to turn to a very familiar passage, Romans chapter 12. Again, we're taking a look at it from a different viewpoint, I believe, as we consider how does this factor in to developing a biblical world view. You can probably quote the first two verses. We refer to those often as well, but I want to read those. Again, think about these two verses in light of a biblical worldview. Therefore, the Apostle says, well, Apostle Paul says, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. As those with a foot in two worlds, there is a type of cosmic squeeze play that's going on. We know full well that this world and this world system is actively trying to get us to conform to its mindset. And you know as I do that the pressure is absolutely tremendous 
from the television programs that we are tempted to watch or maybe do watch, to interaction on social media, to the food that we eat, to clothes that we wear, to the latest electronic gadgets. Is it uh, version 5 now that's out that everybody was lining up to get? Whatever. All those gadgets that would dominate our time and our attention, the pressure again is tremendous for us to conform to those things. So the world is trying to squeeze us in. Last weekend in Canada, we had a, a Saturday workshop where we talked about things in terms of the last days. And a question was raised that's still on my mind. Are we being conditioned by key events for key events of the last days? And I don't know. As we talked about that, are we being squeezed in for some specific things to do with the last days? The Antichrist, as Kermit was talking about in class this morning. Whether or not we specifically are being squeezed in for certain events of the last days, we know without a doubt that there are deliberate efforts by this world system to cause us to conform, to fit in, to be part of the mold of this present world. Of course, the call for us is to be transformed in the way that we think. That is an impossible task. With all the pressure of the world to conform, we cannot do that of our own. That is a spirit thing. And so it takes the spirit of God to develop the kind of a worldview that God wants for us to have. And so a great starting point is we've got to come down and really surrender to the spirit of God to shape and to transform our minds so that we see the world as God wants us to see it. Verse 3, Paul says... Through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. A part of a biblical worldview is to see ourselves, as well as the world, to see ourselves from the right perspective. This much I know about who I am. I know that I've been created in the image of God. I know in Genesis 2, 7 that God took dirt of the ground and that he formed a body and that he breathed into the lungs of that body the breath of life and man became a living being. I believe that about myself. I believe that God has made me a living being and I, I believe he's made me so that I will die and completely die. We talk about that often. That when that day comes when I die, my thoughts perish, I cease to exist in every sense of the word. I know that as a mortal being in this age, I'm under a sentence of death because of what our first parents did. That's our lot in life as we live in this world. And so there is a sentence that hangs over every one of us. But as Paul says in verse 3, uh, we are grace people as well. And so let's not get bogged down about the sentence of death that hangs over us. We also enjoy the grace of God. We are people that God highly favors through His Son, Jesus Christ. It's important to have that view of God because way too many people look at God as a harsh, judgmental God. You step out of line and zap, that's it. God is a holy God, but in Christ Jesus, as His children, we enjoy His favor. As Paul says, as those who enjoy the grace and the favor of God, don't let it go to your head. Uh, don't think more highly of yourself than what you ought to think. But instead, he says, use sound judgment according to the portion of faith that God has given to us each one. An interesting thought. We don't all have the same measure or portion of faith God has given us as He sees fit. But each one of us in the family of God have a certain measure of faith that's been given to us. And accordingly, we're supposed to exercise some spiritual gifts because He has gifted us as we look into some of these verses here. We are gifted to operate in a particular way according to His Spirit. And so verses 4 to 8 talk about that and talk about various capacities, comparing us, the church, to the, body of, uh, to the human body. We are literally called the body of Christ. And so an important part of our worldview is that we view each other in the body of Christ as having connection and that we work together as a group in the body of Christ as we uh, look out over the world that we live in today. Verses 9 to 13 talk about largely how we operate with one another and how we relate to one another. We're told that we're supposed to be non-hypocritical in our love for each other, be sincere in how we love each other. We are to be compassionately devoted to one another. We're to have a vibrancy in our service. 
We're to be hope motivated. We talk a great deal about that hope of the kingdom and resurrection and immortality. We are motivated by that. We are dedicated to the work of prayer, we're told here, and we actively assist with the needs of those that have needs in the body of Christ. We gen uh, generously open up our homes for fellowship to share with one another. Paul introduces another thought that's got to be part of our worldview, and it's not so pleasant to talk about. He brings in the word tribulation. And so we're told that we persevere amidst the tribulation that we face in the world. Time and time again, we are reminded that if we're going to have a biblical worldview, it involves knowing that the world system is going to be abusive towards us and sometimes violently abusive towards us. We might actually pay with our lives because of a system opposed to us. And so the rest of this chapter, the Apostle Paul talks about how do we respond to an abusive system as we live in the midst of it. He tells us that we don't retaliate, as difficult as that is, verses 17 and 19. That we seek to live peacefully within the world system, according to verse 18, so much as is possible with us. And as he says that, it leaves the door open to say, no matter how hard you try, it is not always going to work out that way. So a biblical worldview directs us to be actively repaying evil with good, which is also very, very difficult. We feed and help and quench the thirst of our enemies, as he says here, and in so doing, we heap burning coals of shame and regret upon those that mistreat us. Again, the question, how should we then live in this world? That is a question we're going to visit time and time again in upcoming weeks and upcoming studies. The more that we know about the world around us, our relationship and our responsibility to it, the more clearly we see how we're supposed to live in this world.